So it's my pleasure to, uh, to talk with you all uh, here today. I've actually been a volunteer at this program before, and I really uh, like the DCB program and so glad that all of you students can be here uh, alongside with your, uh, with your parents. So I know that this is a special uh, Father's Day event, so I'll start by saying happy early Father's Day to uh, all the parents in here. I'm actually a new dad. Some of you may have heard my son Gus crying in the other room there. <laughs> uh, he's eight months old, and so this will be uh, my first Father's Day. How many uh, parents here uh, have more than one child? How about more than two? More than three? Wow, more than four? All right, still. Still, that's like I, I being a, uh, a novice uh, father here of only eight months, having the least experience in the room, uh, can just say hats off to, to all of you who uh, have more than one child, and I'm sure we'll probably get there at some point. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, happy Father's Day to everyone. And just for, um, for all you students here, you know, I wasn't always this age, so I'm 35 now. Uh, but at one time, uh, you know, I was also about three years old, so I'm three years old in this picture, and that's my dad and my sister, and my dad is reading us a book. Not only was I three years old, but I was also your age at one time. Uh, and what I want to convince you by the end of today is that uh, maybe I'm not so different from any of you, even though we have an, an age difference at this point. Maybe some of the things that I've been through uh, or experienced might, might inspire you, and I hope you'll, uh, you'll feel like you can do anything you put your mind to. Um, so to start with that, how many of you here are in the sixth grade? I understand this is a middle school in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. Anyone younger than sixth grade? Okay, got a few folks. All right, so this is me in the sixth grade. Uh, that's pretty awesome. Uh, so this is in uh, Palatine, Illinois, where I grew up, just outside of Chicago. Um, and this is a photograph. This is not taken with a phone, as I'm sure many of, uh, of you get many photos taken by your parents uh, all the time. Uh, I know this was the first day of school, because that was one of the only times when you did take pictures, because it was film, and film costs money. So it was that and some special events uh, where we would get actual photographs taken. And when I was uh, in sixth grade, or around your age, um, I was really into skateboarding, I was into baseball, and I was into video games. And I was allowed to play some video games and others I wasn't. Uh, Super Mario was okay, but some of the parents here may remember a game called Mortal Kombat that came out right when I was in sixth grade. Was not allowed to play it, and I'm sure many of, uh, many of the students here have some video games that maybe their parents don't let them pl play or would prefer not to. They're looking out for your best interest, but I'm just saying, I've been there, I've been there. So that was me uh, in 1992, around sixth grade. And then this is me at the end of high school, up there on the left. And so quite a transformation in six years. A lot changes in that time, so hold on, uh, buckle in. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun, but a lot's going to change. And when I was in high school, I was, I was just an average student. I wasn't at the top of my class. I wasn't at the lower end, but I was, I was somewhere in the middle. And I was into a lot of different things. I wanted to learn a lot of new things. One thing I, I experimented with, I went into theater. I was also part of the wrestling team. I got into guitar at the age of 15. I loved it, would play guitar all the time. That was one of my favorite things uh, to do. I still play today. I ran for class president and I lost. I was close, but I lost. Um, but I, I still, I, I stuck my neck out there and I tried it. And that's what I want to encourage you all to do. Uh, and I also had my first job when I was in high school. My mom got me at a job at an office she worked at. And it was terrible. It was super boring. But the reason that's important is it taught me things I didn't want from a job, and that will become important later on. That job was to call people who used to have accounts with the company, ask them if they still wanted to have the accounts. And then if they did, I had to update a spreadsheet. 40 hours a week in the summer in a small cubicle. I think we have an automated process for doing these types of things now. But that was back then. So after high school, I went off to college, uh, but college was local for me. It was a community college. For those of you who don't know what community college is, it's a, it's a two-year university. Um, and the one uh, in my town was called Harper College. Uh, here you all have uh, Kenyatta College. I believe that's in, in Redwood City. That's also a community college. 
There's a couple benefits for uh, going to community college. One is it allows you to, to save money and you still complete your first two years of school. The second thing is, for someone like me who was an average student, it allowed me to have a clean academic slate. And so my grades were, were, were reasonable, they were pretty good, but it turned out that my standardized test scores uh, weren't that great. I didn't do well on those, those tests, and for me to get into college directly from high school, uh, most schools wouldn't, wouldn't even consider me. So I spent two years in community college, I worked really hard, and then I had many opportunities to go and finish and get my four-year degree. And the places I applied to, everyone said they would, they would take me. I had to rule them out for various reasons. Remember, I, I lived in Illinois. I really wanted to go to Arizona, because uh, I just visited there, and I really uh, liked a different climate than the climate in Chicago. And, uh, but my parents said, no, that's too far, and it's too expensive, we're not paying out of state. Northwestern University, which is a great university, uh, but also a little on the expensive side, so we said no. But University of Illinois, which is, a, which is a great state school in Illinois, I decided to go there. Um, and I'm so glad that I did, because I got a really great education there, and it really laid the foundation for the, the rest of uh, my career and uh, how I ended up here in Silicon Valley, ultimately, which I never could have predict predicted back then. Because when I was in school, when I was at University of Illinois, I transferred and I said, you know what, I'm gonna be a doctor. I wanna be specifically a surgeon. I wanna help people, I wanna see patients. I want to have those type of interactions, and that's what I, was, I set out to do when I was studying biology. At the same time, I got a job in a lab, and this lab studied soybeans. Does everyone here know what soybeans are? Has everyone here eaten soybeans? Okay. So I studied soybeans, and so there's a picture of them there, also called edamame. Uh, and uh, we were really interested in, in soybean genetics, uh, what the, the DNA sequences were of uh, these different uh, types of soybeans and how it gave them their, their properties. And so we did a lot of really cool, uh, I got to help out with a lot of really cool work um, looking at, um, at microarrays where we were able to look at not only what the, the DNA was there, but also how those genes were being expressed. Um, most importantly, I had a lot of fun, and it introduced me to science and to actual lab work, which was something I didn't think I, I would be able to do until I actually got involved in it and found out that it was something I was, I was capable of and, again, set the foundation for uh, why I'm here today. So that's me in the lab uh, working with uh, liquid nitrogen. The, the head of the lab was Lila Vodkin here. This is me pouring some liquid nitrogen into a door. Does anyone know what liquid nitrogen is? Is it hot? It's really cold, right? And so it's maybe something you might use to make ice cream like Dippin' Dots, right? You can also use it to freeze soybeans instantly, and it was really useful uh, in the lab and a lot of fun. And this lab also used robots for these, these studies. And so it introduced me to a number of things, um, <coughs> sorry, at a, uh, um, in a college level. And as I spent more time doing these activities, my dreams of becoming a doctor started to diminish. I was losing uh, interest in them as I, as I uh, became more uh, interested in the research side of things. And as I was finishing up school, I had to start coming to the same thought that uh, if you haven't, obviously you haven't, a lot of you haven't already, but for all the parents in the room, you come to these times where you have to decide what are you going to do next. <clears throat> and, oh. And so here I was in my last year of college, pondering my future, much like this person in the, in the union of the University of Illinois. Very beautiful building. And I sat there and I thought, you know, I'm gonna make a list. <coughs> Excuse me. Of all my experiences so far, and this is the exact list I made. I actually found it, I still have it. I made a list of things I wanted from a job, things I didn't want from a job, and then what those jobs could be. And so <coughs> I, uh, I wrote it out here, some things I wanted from a job continually stimulate my mind, help others, work with like-minded people, work in a cooperative environment, financial stability, I didn't want millions, uh, but be comfortable, that's still the case. Uh, and then <coughs> I wanted to be a boss of sorts, but rule with fairness. And I think what I meant here was mentoring. I think I wanted to be a mentor, and we'll talk about that in a moment. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, I only wanted to work 40 hours a week, which I don't know if that's even a thing anymore, but uh, at that time, it was something that I had wanted. Things I didn't want from a job, and this was based on my, my previous experiences, I didn't want high stress, I didn't want a cubicle, again, based on that job from when I was in high school. 
I didn't want to be seen only as a number. I wanted to be valued as a person. I didn't want to do too much traveling. Some would be OK. And again, this 40 hours per week. And so I looked at this list and I said, OK, these are the things that are really important to me, working with others, stimulating my mind. Really no cubicle, not being seen as a number. So what are the possible jobs? So <clears throat> one was a philosophy professor. I was also interested in philosophy at the time. Could be a lawyer, could be uh, continue down the road of research and become a professor. Again, that was something I had been working towards. Could be an author, I was interested in that. Maybe a motivational speaker. And I started going through this list, and the motivational speaker was out, because as you've already heard, my last name is Robbins, and there's someone else with the last name Robbins who's cornered most of the market share in motivational speaking. So I ruled that one out. <coughs> a lawyer I decided against, because I'm not really good at arguing. And I decided, you know what, I really like this research. I want to continue down this road. And so if you want to do that when you finish college, then you go on to graduate school. And graduate school, for me, was great. And I went to, the Loyola, I went to Loyola University of Chicago. And my mentor was uh, Dr. Catherine Knight. And she still has a, an active lab today, fantastic mentor. And when I was with her, I, I studied uh, molecular immunology. Um, and so really what this is is understanding uh, what weapons the immune system has to arm itself against a variety of uh, bacteria and viruses we encounter uh, every day. And one of the things that's really important here about my time in this lab and that I want to emphasize here is to seek out good mentors that will help you grow. Um, I would have to say that my ability to think critically about science, to write about science, uh, to present, to design experiments, all the foundation for that was laid by, uh, by my time uh, working uh, with Dr. Knight uh, at Loyola University. And so you'll have opportunities not only now, but in high school, college, and beyond that, to find people who can coach you and will have your best interests at heart. Uh, and this is one of the people who's, who's the best at it. And I really uh, attribute a lot of um, uh, where I am today to her. So <clears throat> when I finished uh, graduate school, uh, I ended up with a PhD in immunology, so a, a doctorate degree. So I guess I sort of became a, a doctor of sorts, uh, but not a, not a medical doctor. Uh, and the next step after graduate school for people who get their PhD in research uh, is what's called a postdoc, which is really where you continue research after grad school. <clears throat> and I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I continued to study the immune system, but I studied the immune system in combination with, um, with nanotechnology, in particular uh, nanoparticle vaccines. And it turns out that these nanoparticles are really teeny tiny little particles. If you control the shape and composition of those, you can control uh, the immune response and, and help get better uh, responses to viruses and bacteria. <clears throat> so I went from learning about the immune system to how to apply that knowledge uh, to developing vaccines. Can someone here tell me what a vaccine is? Yes. That's perfect, yes. It's a dead or weakened uh, virus or bacteria that allow your body to form an immune response before the fully pathogenic version, uh, before you should encounter uh, that version. And so has everyone here received a vaccine? Likely, yeah? Pro OK, I hope so. <laughs> so uh, it turns out that uh, you can also deliver vaccines by different methods. And so what's the common way that you get vaccines now? Anybody, shout it out. Injection or a shot, right? And who likes to get shots? Nobody, right? One person, OK. Well, this isn't for you then. <laughs> but one of the things we wondered was, could we use a microneedle uh, patch? And a microneedle patch is basically, you can see this patch here. It's very tiny. It's smaller than a penny. And it has these really sharp needles on it, but they're really short. And the question is, could you use that patch to deliver a vaccine through the skin? And the idea here would be you'd have a painless vaccination, which the, the needle uh, usually gives you. Perhaps you could even give the uh, vaccine to yourself so you wouldn't have to go visit your doctor. And again, just no needles involved at all. And so this was something that 
uh, we were really interested in pursuing, but the question is how do you go about making a microneedle patch? And there are multiple ways to do it. And the one I'll tell you about today is 3D printing. So does everyone here, does anyone here not know what 3D printing is? It's okay if you don't. I didn't know much about it until I uh, started doing this research. Has anyone here 3D printed something? Okay. And, and can you tell me what kind of printer you used? Ultimaker? Okay, all right. Yeah, so I think that's, it's a common, that's a common type of um, machine used in, in uh, academics uh, or in, in schools. And what I'll tell you about is just the basics of uh, 3D printing. And so it starts with a digital computer file. And ultimately, you want to convert this file or idea. And this is a bunny rabbit here, but it really could be anything you think of. And you want to convert that thing into some sort of solid material. In this case, it's going to be a plastic. And the way that, that these machines, like, you're, like you mentioned there, uh, work is they have a plastic filament um, that then melts and, and ultimately is deposited in such a way that you get this final part. But before that, you have to take this file and run it through slicing software. And so imagine that this file is, is a loaf of bread in the shape of a bunny, and you make a whole bunch of slices. And then you run all those slices one at a time through this machine, and it's going to melt this material and then deposit it in the shape of each individual slice, and it's going to build up from here. And then eventually, what you get out is your final plastic bunny. Now, you can 3D print, again, any shape, and this is one type of printer, and it's the most common type you'll run into in academics. Now, the printers we use at the company I work at called Carbon work differently. Instead of having a, a spool of uh, filament or of, of a plastic wire, we start with a liquid bath. And what you can do is you can shine light on that bath, and it will solidify that liquid resin into a solid plastic. And it uses technology just like your TVs to project an image into that liquid bath and then make your plastic part. I'll show you a video here um, of our machine. So this is our machine. This is the build platform. It goes down into the liquid. And the machine's going to, or the part is going to stick to this platform. You see that liquid rise there. And from the bottom, you're going to see an image projected. And that image projection is coordinated with the upward movement of this build platform. And that's all controlled by software. Software is like the conductor of the orchestra here. And you can see as this cross-section changes, so will the shape of the part change as well. And being able to grow these parts out of a liquid bath um, allows for two things. One is you can print faster. Second thing is you have a much wider array of materials you can choose from because you don't have to get this into a wire form and then onto a spool. And so in this case, we didn't print a bunny. We just this is a demo part that we print, but that's printed from a, a material that if you put that in your oven, it would not melt. And so we can create these materials with special properties. Whereas that bunny I showed you before would melt pretty quickly. So you can use 3D printing to print whatever you want. You can even use it to print microneedles. And so here's a microneedle patch that I uh, printed while I was at the University of North Carolina. And as I said, we can make a variety of materials. And what I worked on was making a material that would print a hard plastic, but then dissolve in water. And so if you take this, oh, uh, let me go back here. If you take this uh, patch and you put it in water, in three minutes, those needles dissolve. Turns out there's fluid in your skin that's also sufficient to dissolve these needles. So you could imagine that that, uh, that material uh, would also uh, dissolve there. So, um, sorry. So this is a video of the same material uh, printed in different shapes, and, uh, or printed with this UNC emblem, but I just tuned the material to dissolve uh, progressively uh, over time based on the amount of a certain additive I put in. Uh, so the point is you can do a lot more with uh, these uh, printers and carbons technology because you can use a variety of materials. Um, so what I wanted to, to go through, and I'll, just, I'll go through a little bit quickly here, is that you know, in order to, to make our machine, this is our 3D printer and all the other products we make, it's really not just a couple of people. It re, it's a lot of people. It requires you know, someone to first have the idea, and then you need a lot of uh, engineers, and you also need a lot of folks who aren't part of engineering in order to uh, make this, this product a reality. 
Um, and so just to give you an idea, the initial invention or idea for the underlying technology of this printer uh, was really developed by only uh, four people initially. But it took us over uh, 100 people at the time of launch of, the, of our first product um, to be able to launch this machine and have it available for customers to buy. And what I want to get across is that teamwork is key. You need so many people to work together with a common goal to get this uh, solved. Now, that's teamwork within a company. What happens when, when companies work together to develop new products? So we have a partnership with Adidas, and one of the things that Adidas thinks a lot about is how to make new footwear, um, and how to make high-performance footwear, uh, as well as new styles of footwear. And so they partnered with us to make, or we partnered, we all, we partnered together in order to make um, uh, a new product that's never been seen before. And this is a, a video just showing that. about people. An evolution of creative freedom. Things so complex, it feels like it should be impossible in the moment. This is the next natural step. Beta. Beta. We never complete. Wildly kind of complex. What's the idea? Evolving the human athlete. Convergence of Design disciplines. Design and manufacturing. Hardware engineering. Software engineering. A workflow where things are Programmable liquid engines and rises. It's, it's a lattice. It's a matrix. Light and oxygen and the bath of this magic material. Remove the bounds of the mold. The future is new. There's no beginning or end. You're limitless. And so what I have right here is that actual shoe uh, that was made through this partnership of Carbon and Adidas. And what I can pass around, or we can look at after, I'll leave them up here because I think we're short on time, but I can let you all come by and, and, and check out this uh, midsole portion. But basically, uh, our printers um, allow for uh, different designs um, across the, the midsole that allow uh, for different features in, in performance. And Adidas brings uh, so much experience in shoe design um, and assembly, and it's really been a, a great uh, partnership. I'll just end by saying, you know, 3D printing allows you to print anything. These are all parts that have been made on our printer, from microneedles to shoes to everything you see here. In particular, I work in the, in the dental uh, area of things, and we just released a 3D printed denture. That's going to change a lot of people's lives. I have that here, too, if any of you would like to see it. Um, I also have this T-Rex head, which is pretty cool. So we can look at all that stuff uh, m maybe in the, in the next hour or so or during lunch. Um, final thoughts, don't be afraid to fail or to ask for help. Um, curiosity and perseverance are better than just being smart. Again, I was an average student, but I was really curious about a lot of things. I worked really hard to get where I was today. And that's where I started, again, in a soybean lab. Uh, in Illinois and made my way all the way here to uh, Silicon Valley. And teamwork is critical. And again, this Adidas example is really, um, really highlights that. Not only teamwork within companies, but across companies. So it's, it's important uh, that you're able to work together uh, with others. And again, not just being smart. Really big things happen uh, as groups. And so I just have to thank so many people and so many great institutions in the company Carbon where I'm at right now. And thank you all uh, for your time. Yeah. All right, so we have time for a couple questions. And don't worry, Greg is going to be hanging out with us throughout lunch. Yeah. So I encourage you all to take some time to talk to him. So if you do have a question, raise yeah, your hand and one of us will come get you with a microphone. Yes. So great presentation, uh, Thank you. Uh, very enlightening. Uh, the technology that you're using, is it only uh, is, is unique to your co company Carbon or there are competitors that are out there? So, so we have, um, one of our big superpowers is our materials. We have a lot of unique materials that allow you to make something like a shoe midsole to a microneedle to things for, for prototyping for automotive and so on. Um, 
So that's a big part of it, and also our ability to, to print faster. Um, I really can't, can't speak much on you know, comparisons of our technology to other groups that may have something similar. I'm just not able to speak on that here. Thank you. Are you a public company yet? No, we're not a public company. We're privately held. Yes. Part of it, printing so we, these holes. So we have a we uh, part of our headquarters here in Redwood City is a factory for making the midsoles. We are bringing up other sites uh, around the world uh, in order to produce uh, more of these midsoles, and that's all being worked on. So again, I don't work directly uh, with the midsole side. I'm more in the, the dental side, so I don't have as much visibility uh, there. But we have. Um, uh, these will be, be manufactured through Adidas as well, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question over here. Oh, yes. What are the breakthroughs on the dental side that you're working on? The breakthroughs on the dental side? So uh, what I didn't have time to talk as much about, um, but I have it here in my pocket, is actually the, the first uh, FDA-cleared uh, denture and, and tooth resin where you can directly print a denture that can go into somebody's mouth. And so this could change you know, a, lot of, a lot of people's lives. There's a lot of folks out there, actually, more than I realized, who are, uh, are either uh, partially missing all of their teeth or have no teeth at all. And this provides uh, a fast and, and cheaper way to make dentures than a traditionally made denture. So that, that's, our, that's our latest big break. Yeah. All right, so I know there's a lot more questions, and like I said, he will be with us during lunch, but we do need to wrap up. I yeah. do want to ask one more question, and that is, what advice would you share with these students as they think about the path that they want to take to their future? Yeah. I think the most important thing is to, to, to keep an open mind and to try new things. And, you know, that, that might sound a bit generic, but, you know, I... I couldn't have predicted uh, sitting in that building at, at the university uh, when I was in my senior year that I would have ended up here working on you know, 3D printing technology and talking to you all today. There's no way I could have predicted that. What I did was I, I said yes to a lot of different experiences and I tried new things and found stuff that I liked and I worked really hard and I think that's what got recognized. I mean, I'm not trained as an engineer, I'm trained as a an immunologist, and here I'm working on 3D printing, and, and a lot of that's because I think my hard work has been, has been recognized uh, over the years, and so it will, it will give you new opportunities. So say yes to a lot of things, uh, work hard, and work together. Yeah. All right, let's give another hand for Greg. Right, thank you.